Hi guys, my name is Leon, and I'm riding my Vesk to school today. Um, this is my newly upgraded Vesk. It's got um, the Maker's PV Flow Guider V3.1 box inside, and it's got a stock battery with no BMS. Um, this is a pretty lazy build in terms of Vesk building. I'm trying to make it better in the future by like adding BMS and upgrading the battery, but right now this is this is what I got, and. Um, I'm not a super hardcore rider. I can do some tricks, but that's like that's about it. I'm still a commuter, and I only ride. On, I pretty much only ride on street. So my perspective will be a lot more um, beginner than people like Vestman and Mad Max who are shredding these on trails and uh, doing time trials with it. As a general one wheel community, this Vesk thing is still pretty new and. It might be a little bit difficult for beginners to understand what's going on, so I guess that's the perspective I'll be offering. It's from someone who's not the most technical rider in the world. Um, right here I'm doing a spin, and you can see just how tight the, the vest can turn. Uh, I've given my board to one of my friends who rides a GT, and even though I already have the settings for turning dialed way down, it still feels super responsive and initially kind of weird, actually. Um, it actually feels really weird to step on a vest and turn for the first time. It'll feel like the board is balancing on the edges. Um, I feel like the vest is the only way to fully take advantage of the insane shoulder of the Enduro tire. Uh, the Enduro just edge holds so well, and the vest really unlocks that part of the tire. You can like actually ride on the edge um, which is which is great for enduro. I feel like Vest just unlocks the full potential of it. Uh, so for this run, I'm going to Tandon, which is my one of my university's campuses, uh, because there are free 3D printers there <laughs> that I can use, and um, I've just ordered the WTF Center Steeds from TFL, and this fender, this like shorty fender I've got on there won't, it'll it'll rub basically. So I've prototyped new fenders for the WTF rails that won't rub, and I've beefed up places where they need to be beefed up. Um, I've also printed bumper boys, so I'm in route to like get that print. Um, and I'm really excited to be making some prototypes on my one wheels now. Um, I'm, I'm trying to stick to bike lanes as much as possible because New York City streets is, is really, really difficult to ride. Um, some places it literally feels like trail because it's so bumpy and the consequence of falling is like death because there are cars behind you. Um, so bike lanes is the way to go if you're really trying to commute long term. Um, on the side profile, by the way, you can see the pushback settings. I'll be, uh, I'll be trying to hold my camera on the sideway profile so you guys can see the pushback. But because I ride in Manhattan, um, pushback is really, really important. And riding a Vesk makes you respect pushback a lot more because it's duty cycle based. Duty cycle, if you don't know, it's a fancy word of saying um, available motor strength. Like 100% duty cycle equals to nose dive and zero equals to standing still. So um, I have mine tuned at duty cycle pushback of 75%, which is pretty conservative. Um, I think most people have it around 80%, so you unlock more speed before pushback kicks in. Um, but because pushback is very important to me, because I ride on Manhattan, uh, so I have it set at 70%. Even so, on flat roads, I'm pretty constantly hitting faster speeds uh, than a stock XR with uh, future motion pushback. And it also, as I said, makes you respect pushback a lot more because you know the board is like actually at its limit when it's giving you pushback. For example, on downhills, a lot of the times I just straight up don't respect pushback at all because I imagine that the board will have more torque. But when you're riding a Vesk and doing duty cycle based pushbacks, uh, you know the board is actually struggling when it's pushing you back. So. Uh, I tend to push through pushback a lot less on a Vesk simply because I personally chose the settings to let it push back. And if I don't, if I want to push through pushback, I could have just like 
change the setting. So um, that's one of the perks of VESC. Um, and it makes me ride faster while being more conservative, which I really like. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, these, these are the best for bonks because they're really solid and they pop you out a whole lot. I'll be trying to bonk some of these as I'm doing this run, but like as I, um, as I have I already said it? I don't think I've said it, but I'm really on a time crunch today uh, because I need to make a 40 minute commute in half the time. And I actually did it, which I'm really, really proud of. Um, the Vesk is really able to push those speeds and sustain it, uh, which is really cool. <laughs> um, currently, I'm writing the, the board setup I'm writing. Um, as I said, it's a, a Little Fokker by Makers BEV. This is the V3.1. Um, I bought the fully assembled Flow Glider box, but right now I don't think they're selling it yet because the website is still down and they still need to do some, like, pass through some city checks or something before they can release, uh, keep, keep releasing that. Um, but except for that, the back is stock battery. Um, this is, the stock battery is a 63 volt battery, which is, um, to put it in perspective, the GT is a 74 volt, and the, like, the most high performing VESC is 84 volt. Um, even so, on a set, on a 63 volt battery, the stock XR battery, I'm getting similar performance to a GT at higher voltage because the VESC is the VESC brand is able to pro, uh, not process, it's able to um, hit higher amperage, which makes up for the lower voltage because voltage times amps is watts. Um, the good way to remember that is West Virginia, West W equals to V times A. That's a good way to remember it if you don't know how to remember volts, watts, and amps. Um, except for that, I'm running uh, the... I'm not on the Superflux yet, and I'm not sure if I will be upgrading because the Superflux is actually um, heavier than the Hypercore motor, which I, I'm i fine with the Hypercore. <laughs> I don't know if I want to upgrade to a Superflux, but that, that'll be in the future. Um, the battery, I have ordered the Mario Contino 18S battery. Uh, that one, to my knowledge, is the highest range battery, uh, highest range um, battery that you can buy. Like, of course, you can commission someone to build you a battery, which is actually more common than I thought. Uh, but that's a 640-something watt battery, which is actually more range than a CBXR. Um, that's good news for me as a heavier rider. I'm like 200 pounds. Um, that will get me like well over CBXR range. And uh, 70, it, basically the trade-off is you can either get a 74 volt, 75, 74 volt battery that's have crazy range, or you can get a 20S battery, which is a 84 volt, which is the highest performing performance battery but with lower range. And to me, riding a 63 volt battery, 72, I think is enough. I don't think I'll be pushing 84 volts on city streets. Um, and for the few times that I do trails, I, I really doubt that I will be hitting the 80. I'll be taking full advantage of the 84 volt when the 63 volt is doing surprisingly well. Um, so I've gone, I've opted for more range than uh, higher torque, which sounds less sexy, but I think it's a good decision. The rest of the boards are pretty pretty standard as an XR. It's got uh, Varios. I've, I'm currently running the LOL Varios, which is, stands for lift or lower, um, because simply because WTFs are out of stock. But now they're in stock, I've purchased the W rails, and they will be here uh, really soon. So I'm really excited for that. The back of the board, it's a Kush Low. I've tried the Kush High, it's a little bit too high for me, and I haven't tried the Kush Wide, but I think I like it. If I if I were to pick this out again, I'll probably go with the Kush Wide, but in the meantime, the Kush Load is fine, and I don't feel like spending 100 bucks on foot pads yet. Um, the tires Enduro, of course, <laughs> and the I've got Lifesavers as well. Um, band bumpers, of course. Right now, I'm going over the Manhattan, hmm? no, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. 
And this is a very good opportunity to, to talk about ATR, which stands for Adaptive Torque Response. Uh, basically, it takes your expected torque and your actual torque and compares them. And if there's a huge disparity between the two, it assumes that you're going either uphill or downhill and adjusts your nose accordingly. And you can actually set this independently for uphill and downhill. So basically, I've got my downhill strength super high, so the nose drops as I go downhill. But uphill, I don't really want the nose to rise that much because then it really confuses me with pushback. And it makes me unable to distinguish the difference between ATR and pushback if I have ATR super high. Um, going uphill, you're basically going to be riding pushback constantly. So I don't really feel like there's a need for ATR to then raise the nose again. And in the side profile of a minute ago, you can clearly see that the board is pretty, pretty much parallel to the ground. Um, you can't really tell, but I am going uphill and the board is staying level to the terrain. Right now we're approaching downhill and you can, I don't know if you can see, but I have the downhill twice the strength as uphill. Um, it feels really nice to me to get the nose lowered and then have push back, push it back up. Um, that's personally how I like it, but your mileage may vary. And I know some people who really like uphill ATR. Uh, the side effect of ATR is it's called adaptive torque response, not adaptive terrain response, because it's based on torque. It, it doesn't only trigger on uphill events, uphill or downhill events. Basically, anytime the, the expected torque is more, for example, if you're going headwind, um, if you're going over trail, like gravel, which are super difficult, um, anytime you need more torque, it'll give you more torque by stiffening the nose. Um, that's a side effect from the terrain response. But basically, it makes your board flowy when you, you can set your board super flowy when you don't need that torque, like on city streets. But as soon as you hit like cobblestone, for example, it'll stiffen up the nose and make it really solid. Um, I really like that personally. Uh, I kind of like it flowy when I'm doing tricks and stuff, but it's stiff when you need it, basically. And after this run, I've gone with a trail ride. And it, it feels really nice to have that stiff nose when you need it and you just can like stand on the nose on an uphill and it'll just like take you up. It feels amazing. Uh, I will have to warn you that my memory card is filling up and at one point it'll just like cut off. But I'm pretty close. I'm like two blocks away from the destination by then so they're not missing much. Here you can see basically the nose is level and we're starting to hit a little bit of pushback. Um, it just feels really, really safe to have the tail lift up high when you're going downhill because if, if you've ever ridden downhill and your tail scrapes the ground, it's like more terrifying than nosedive. It, you literally lose all control over the board. It feels horrible. So how difficult is it to build a VESC? Well, it's very easy actually to build a VESC, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to build a good VESC. So the biggest problem right now is the BMS situation. Um, what I'm running right now is no BMS on a stock battery, which is really easy to do. All you need to do is swap the controller box and then take out the stock BMS and then like plug one cable in. That's, that's literally it. Um, where this gets tricky is that running without a BMS is very risky. Some people don't even, like battery builders, don't even consider this a solution at all. So if you don't want to solve the BMS situation, don't, don't get into VESC at all. It'll just get you stuck with a board without a BMS. Um, so trying to build a board with a BMS, you need to know, you, it is very recommended to uh, learn how to solder. At the very least, know how to plug cables in. <laughs> and it is mandatory to learn how to use a multimeter. None of these things are impossible, but you do have to like watch a few YouTube videos and like actually learn some basics of mechanical engineering. And um, I would encourage people to try to get into VESC space. It definitely, re it, it's definitely a learning curve, but I personally feel like it's very, it's a very rewarding experience. Um, at least it makes me appreciate my GT a lot more. Um, the GT just writes so good. 
Currently, I still have a few issues to work out on my VESC. It doesn't feel like super solid yet, but um, it'll, it'll get dialed in a few weeks. And I'm just, I'm excited for the future of one wheeling with VESC and one wheel being in the same space. And I encourage you to join this community of VESC builders. Um, yeah, that's the end of the video because my memory card ran out of space. Bye.